Some of you may know the, the backstory to that hymn we just sang. Um, it is a classic in, in many respects. It was written by a man by the name of Horatio Spafford. He was an attorney and a businessman in Chicago and an elder in his Presbyterian church. And it was 1871, the, the Chicago fire that destroyed so much of the city, destroyed much of their family's wealth. Uh, two years after that, largely because of his wife's health, the family scheduled a trip to Europe. And at the last minute, some business arrangements required him to stay home, so his wife Anna and their four daughters took the ship for Europe. And somewhere in the midst of that crossing, they were struck by another ship. And his four daughters drowned. His wife was found unconscious on a piece of debris. Nine days after the wreck, this was before the internet, he received a cable from his wife who was in Wales that said, saved alone, what shall I do? And he immediately booked passage on a ship and was crossing the Atlantic. And when they came to the point where the ship his family had been on had gone down, the captain called him to his cabin and said, this is the place where your daughters drown. And he wrote the words to that hymn while crossing the Atlantic. It is well with my soul, those sorrows like sea billows roll. That wasn't just a poetic language to him. They returned to the States. He and his wife had three more children. Their son, when he was four, died with scarlet fever. They opened their home to a Bible study and began to serve people in the city. And from there, God led them to Jerusalem. They moved, they opened a children's home, the American colony. And it's a matter of record that both Jewish, Arab, and Christians that were in the Israel at the time recognized the steadfastness of those people. If you visit Jerusalem today, you can visit the American Colony Hotel. They have a great restaurant. <laughs> I was just trying to support the hymn. That was the only reason I was there. <laughs> but sorrow and heartache and difficulty don't preclude our lives from being fruitful. Amen. Amen. You know, so often we're afraid if someone we love or are in our own selves, we face a challenge or a difficulty that it has destroyed our lives. It may have disrupted our plans and our agenda and made them beyond our reach, but it has not destroyed the ability of God to write a story for us. Amen. That's true. And that leads me to our offertory prayer today. I think we should pray for those folks in Hawaii who have lost so much and for those who are doing their best to help them recover. Uh, and I, to be honest, while we pray for them, I think we should pray for the cities of our nation. Our cities are in disarray, far worse than they're telling us. They are tinder boxes, maybe not for a wildfire, but for tremendous disruption. I don't know the purpose of doing it as intentionally as it's being done, but it's being done. And so while we pray for those people in Hawaii for God's mercy, let's pray for his mercy upon all of us. Can you stand with me for that prayer? If you're joining us from home this morning, put down your coffee. I'm going to pray till it gets cold. <clears throat> hmm. The corporate prayers of God's people make a difference. You know, I'm an advocate for individual prayer, and I'm an advocate for prayer in all sorts and sizes of groups. But when God's people care enough to join together, invest their time and energy and effort to pray, it has a unique impact in heaven. Uh, we've lost sight of that. We've relegated corporate prayers to formal expressions of something, beginning or ending or transitions. That's, a, a, that's an injustice to the value of prayer. So I thank you for joining in our group exercise and learning to pray. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the great honor and privilege of being together today. We thank you for that freedom and liberty. We pause to pray especially for those people, Lord, that have lost homes and loved ones and businesses, Lord, so much in the fires that we have seen and heard about. We ask for your mercy, Lord. 
We pray for those that are working on their behalf, that they'll have supernatural energy and strength and awareness, that there'll be a spirit of cooperation, that there'll be no competition, Lord, that you'll keep away those who would seek to profit or to gain an advantage from the pain and suffering of others. For those who have lost much, I pray for comfort. Lord, I pray that they'll be more aware of the promise of what is before them than the loss of what has happened. Bring healing to them and hope to them. For those who sustained physical injuries, Lord, may their recovery be supernatural. And Lord, as we pray for them, we pray for the cities across our nation. We are a nation in need of healing. Lord, we have ignored you and refused to cooperate with you in so many times. And we come today and ask you to look upon us with mercy. Lord, we have no excuses. We don't seek to justify our behavior and our choices. We acknowledge it as sin and choose a new direction before you. But I pray that you would look upon us and begin a process of healing and restoration and renewal. We thank you for it. May our hearts turn to you as never before. Give us leaders in city after city, community after community who fear your name and who will stand for truth and righteousness, godliness and holiness and purity. Forgive us for supporting those who don't. We thank you, Father, for the good things ahead, that you're a God who delights in showing mercy. We praise you for it today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Before you're seated, I caught you. I tried that last night, and they got to their chair before I got to them. Greet a couple of persons near you. Smile and tell them you're glad they're here. Huh? Thank you. All right, just greet them. Don't discuss lunch plans. We want to share a video with you. Uh, we have a habit, oftentimes when we have guests who come and, and minister here, that I'll do a podcast with them. It gives us an opportunity to have a little bit of a different kind of a conversation than often is a part of a presentation in a sanctuary. And I know some of you listen to podcasts on a regular basis. Some of you don't know what one is. God loves both groups. It's okay. But they, they edited together some excerpts from some of those podcasts the other day for a, a, another objective. When they showed it to us, it was so good. We wanted to share it with you. Well, it's not long. It's only about an hour and a half. But it's, it's, it's just um, a, a quick overview of some of the folks that have um, shared with us in the last few months. And their comments, I believe, will be an encouragement to you. I'm amazed at the voices God brings to a little country church. He's been good to us. People have gotten this sick, unbiblical idea that they're only supposed to quote unquote preach the gospel. What does that mean? Jesus didn't just preach the gospel. He spoke truth. His Holy Spirit lives inside you and wants to use you to speak truth on every one of these issues. Would you be afraid to say, vote for somebody who is against the slave trade? The last time I checked the statistics, Alan, there was 40 million registered Christian voters. Now there's a lot of other Christians who are not even registered to vote, but there's 40 million registered Christian voters who did not vote in the last presidential election. We get to actually select our leaders, and I, I think that it's a sacred responsibility and duty that we have as Christians to do that. Because um, when the righteous rule, the people prosper. This notion of separation of church and state is so bogus. When these guys got together, their idea was not to make a secular America. Their idea was to separate the government where it could never control the church or control religion, but it wasn't to secularize the government because they recognized even in the Bible, where did the law come from? It came from God given to Moses. When we see the law 
out of place. When we see the law violating God's law and God's commandments, it's incumbent upon people like you and I to stand up and fight for those who can't fight for themselves. Each one of us has a choice because the middle of the road is going away. We can be in right relationship with the Lord or we can be in right relationship with the machine. You have to choose. It wasn't Islam that got us to where we're at as a nation. The freedoms that we that we observe, all of those things, it came from Judeo-Christian values. Amen. And we have to understand that and begin to be bold in it and apply it to every aspect of our lives. And I think we'll come close to seeing, you know, the country turn around like we want it to. I refuse to allow my faith to be called dangerous in the public square. And the Christians have been too quiet. We're gonna to have to have the courage to say, how dare you? We couldn't say that about any other subgroup of our culture. And when they say that about Christians, they're giving the broader culture permission to dehumanize us a little bit. And we have the same rights and privileges under the law that everybody else does. We can't yield that. It's, it's good to be reminded that there are voices, men and women, speaking the truth. Um, it, it's important to be reminded of that and to make the effort to stand up and to use your voice, to honor the Lord, to honor his word, to encourage people to do so. Uh, we have yielded the arena for too long, and it's time to take our faith back with us. I had a conversation this week with a a family who, they've actually put together a little curriculum, I'll share it with you in the weeks ahead, but to help families with children in the public schools. And they weren't a family with tremendous resources or great training. They simply had three children and a concern that as they began their journey through the public schools that their faith would grow and not be diminished. And now that their, their children are in, in finishing high school, they have an amazing story to tell about classes that have been changed and schools that have been changed because their children took their faith with them to school. And it reminded me that the only way that they could take prayer out of schools and the Bible out of school and the Ten Commandments out of school is that we had first taken them out of our homes. If we will send our children into the public arenas prepared with their faith in a meaningful way that it's so vital to them, it's not a part of what they do on Sunday morning, it's who they are, it's the substance and the fabric of their families, then it will affect the places where they gather. It's the same is true of our workplaces and our neighborhoods. If, if you're known more for the parties you throw than the prayers you pray, something is out of place. And it's got to begin in the hearts of the church and God's people. And I believe we've seen, we're seeing it begin. So it's a time to be, uh, I believe, hopeful and to be optimistic about what is before us. God is awakening his people. Amen. All right. You should have received an outline when you came in. Don't take that off my preaching time. <laughs> Next service is Wednesday night. We've got plenty of time. <laughs> We've begun a new series in a previous session on spiritual warfare in the end times. Spiritual warfare in the end times. I, I added the end times because I think there's some things that spiritual warfare is a part of human existence on this planet. It goes all the way to the opening chapters of Genesis. But as we approach the end of the age, there are some characteristics that the Bible tells us about so that we can be prepared that will become increasingly prevalent. So we're going to talk a bit about spiritual warfare and the implications of that for our lives, and then specifically as we approach the end of the age. For this session, the topic is not my problem. And it's really the question I want to put before you. Do you, do you have an imagination that you have a responsibility, an assignment, a role to play? Is it something to be endured? Do you just hope that you understand how to receive God's blessings, and if you don't pay any attention, perhaps it'll just be okay? Uh, I've kind of imagined this session as really basic training. We're at the beginning of this little study, so if you'll bear with me, what I'd like to do is give you some fundamental components, some keys that really are essential to understanding biblically what's happening in our world, and then what our responses can be. My, my goal is not simply the exchange of information or I would have stayed in universities. Our goal is to mobilize the body of Christ, to respond with the truth that we know, to engage the world in which we live. Church is not primarily about education and information. It's far more about mobilization. The true measure of the church is who we are when we're not here. 
You know, we come in here to be encouraged, to be strengthened, to provide some opportunities for our children, for all the things that come from those corporate gatherings. But the real measure of the church is our influence when we leave campus. And so that's the goal of this series. And we'll look at some basic training components. And I'll start really with the first. And it really has more to do with a set of questions, I think, about how you view the world and our faith. Do you imagine that our objective is avoidance, appeasement, apathy? Much of the church has been totally engulfed by this notion that our goal is to be tolerant, to be kind, to not bring any division, to not bring any disruption. We want to be peacemakers. Well, I would submit to you both biblically and historically for what that's worth that avoidance, appeasement, and apathy is not an effective strategy. Now, we're very clever at this, we church folk. There's a line that I hear frequently. I seldom go through a week without someone saying this to me, whether it's in the context of what I do here or beyond here, but it'll be something like this. Well, the Bible tells us that before Jesus returns, things are going to get really tough. So there's nothing really we can do about that. We just need a strategy to survive. And in that expression of surrender, they think they've imagined themselves, now my only goal is to focus on me and mine and manage, managing to pro- protect and extend my comfort and convenience for as long as I possibly can. Because after all, Jesus said things are going to get really rough. And so rather than be overcomers, we become overlookers. And we think our assignment everywhere we go is to make no waves. Now, we're going to try to evaluate that from a biblical perspective. But before I do that, I will tell you from a, as a, just a brief review of history, it's a strategy for failure. Appeasement has been tried in some rather enthusiastic ways. i give you one example. Neville Chamberlain. Some of you will know who he is. He was a British prime minister that served the United Kingdom in the the years approaching World War II. It was in that window while Germany was rapidly expanding its power and its influence, building up its military, and as fascism was growing in Europe. And it was growing rapidly enough and powerful enough, and it it was looking with enough aggressiveness around the opportunities of Europe that all those observing it understood the threat. And Chamberlain continually led his nation in the practice of capitulation and appeasement. Now, he excused it with some historical things. The Treaty of Versailles had been too harsh. They had compassion on the Germans. They'd been humiliated by the defeat of World War I. No one would imagine that they would want to face the horrors of another global conflict. I mean, there was a logic for the rationale. There always is. I find that cowards always have logic. We very seldom just walk up and say, I feel cowardly today. (laughs) Well, Chamberlain even went as far as signing the Munich Agreement in September of 1938. Now, I know most of you probably don't remember that. I'm sure you learned it and you passed the test. But it was an agreement with Germany. There were four nations that signed it. Germany had already occupied Austria, and in the Munich Agreement, The most influential voices in Europe gave them a significant portion of Czechoslovakia. They just surrendered the territory and the people who lived there to the Nazi party. They didn't ask their opinion. They wouldn't consider the opinion of the leaders of that nation when they signed the agreement. They just surrendered it away. And Chamberlain then had the brazen audacity to declare publicly peace in our time as if he was the orchestrator of peace. Not so much for the Czech people. You should also know that appeasement in that window of of history was strongly supported by the British upper class and big business, the power brokers in London. It was supported by the House of Lords. It was supported broadly by the media, at that time the BBC. The most powerful voices, the most influential people were all on board saying the best thing we can do is yield to our adversary. The government at that time practiced censorship, limited what was said in the media so that the general public would not be agitated by their policies. Censorship is not a new thing, but it's a real thing. 
Chamberlain preferred, it's a matter of the historical record, Chamberlain preferred popularity to the challenges associated with confronting an adversary. Now, I don't say that to be critical of him. I say that because it feels eerily similar to the posture that the church has held for quite a while. We're reluctant to embrace a biblical worldview. We're, we're reluctant to acknowledge the principles of Scripture. We prefer silence. We're, we're aware enough to understand that if we use our voice or we dared cite a passage of Scripture or a biblical principle that it could incur, incur some responses. I believe we'll have to choose a new course or we will lose our liberties and freedoms completely. I don't want you to be angry. I, I don't want you to be belligerent. I've told you many times you shouldn't be violent. But we have got to become more aware and more courageous regarding our faith. Quite candidly, there will be a cost involved. Not everybody will appreciate your perspective. We see people who hold a very different worldview from our own with great determination taking their worldview and pushing it forward. And when there are tremendous financial costs, I don't hear coming from them apologies. I don't see them changing strategy. I see them wagging an accusatory finger or a demeaning response towards those who don't agree with them. Surely we can at least have the courage that we see being demonstrated by those who hold a different worldview from our own. Matthew chapter 27, this is not a new thing. Shouldn't be limited just to history. It's a part of our biblical narrative as well. Jesus is on trial for his life. The man that holds the ultimate decision over his future is the Roman governor of Judea. You know him, he's Pontius Pilate. And Jesus has a private interview with Pilate and Pilate determines that he's innocent that he's done nothing worthy of execution, of crucifixion, of being tortured to death, but there's tremendous political pressure on Pilate. The religious leaders of the Jewish community want Jesus executed, and they want him executed in the humiliating fashion of the Roman crucifixion. So Pilate is caught in this awkward place. Even his wife has warned him not to have anything to do with this man. She's had a dream, it terrified her. And Pilate's on the horns of a dilemma. His career could be on the line, his fortune, his future, his retirement, his status. All of those things are in play. It's Matthew 27, when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and he washed his hands in front of the crowd. I'm innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's your responsibility. Let me ask you a question. How do you think Pilate's declaration played in heaven? You think Gabriel looked over at Michael and said, well, thank God we don't have to deal with him now. He is innocent. We should all understand that before an almighty God, a God who is sovereign over heaven and earth, we do not have the privilege of declaring our own innocence. We are not the evaluators of that. There is a God. There's a God who created heaven and earth to whom every one of us will ultimately give an account. And the great honor of having access to the Word of God and the presence of the Spirit of God within us is that with the help of the Spirit of God, we can see ourselves and prayerfully have the humility to turn to God in repentance and ask for His mercy. Think of the difference in Pilate's life had he chosen that pathway. He might have lost his job. He might have lost his position. He might have returned to Rome in the terms of the service of the Roman Foreign Service, a failure. But imagine if he'd returned to Rome as an individual of great value in the kingdom of God. Folks, we understand the choice. It's one we're all facing these days. The details are a bit different. Maybe they're not as dramatic as it appears to be in that narrative. But if you're the one that's facing the dilemma, it feels pretty dramatic. Now, we talk about spiritual warfare. It's not a message that's overly well received in the church. I've studied in more than one theological institution where we were all but forbidden to mention it. We wouldn't sing hymns. We wouldn't sing the classic music of the church if it used combative language. Things like onward Christian soldiers. You couldn't use that. It's not a popular message. We understand why in the most practical terms, when we fight wars in the earth, it's not the wealthy or typically the best educated or the most powerful who become the frontline soldiers. Those assignments go to others. 
We understand that. Many of you are veterans. Tragically, we've adopted that attitude regarding spiritual conflict. So we have this imagination that those of us who have the greatest tenure, the most experience, we imagine ourselves to be the most mature spiritually, the most spiritually sophisticated, or those are the most experienced. We don't imagine we should ever become frontline combatants. That's for others, the pagan, the less aware, the less initiated. Well, I, I want to remind you for a moment or two that Jesus established our pattern, and he trained the disciples. So I'm going to ask you just to look with me at that for a moment. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 25, Jesus called the disciples together, the apostles, and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. I want to make a suggestion. I don't believe we can ignore obedience and imagine that God's blessings will continually fill our lives. I believe those of us who know the truth, who have spent time in church and spent time serving and learning and growing and understanding, we are called to be the voice, the salt and the light for the kingdom of God in our generation. I don't believe we can delegate that just to the professionals or to the political class or to whomever we imagine should carry that banner. Then I think if we ignore that, if we choose to turn away, I believe we need to understand that the, the deterioration will continue, not just beyond us, but it will accelerate within us. Not just my opinion. Look in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 is the introduction to, to arguably the greatest theological presentation that we have available to us. The book of Romans is a masterful presentation of the redemptive story of Jesus of Nazareth. And the very first chapter establishes a downward progression of humanity when we refuse to acknowledge God and give thanks to Him. And as we're nearing the end of that downward progression, Paul makes a rather remarkable statement. He says, since they didn't think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. So the assumption is that the, the persons being discussed have a knowledge of God. He's not unknown to them. The Scripture isn't unknown to them. Biblical principles are not unknown to them. It was just inconvenient to remember it. We all understand that. We have all been in places where it was a little inconvenient to know right and wrong. So we're just kind of hoping for a little memory hiccup. We can plead ignorance. Maybe we can get a bowl of water and wash a bit. Since they didn't consider it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. The language, I believe, is important. God gave them something. He gave them the freedom to do without hindrance what they wanted to do. He released them. That suggests there had been some restraining influence, some sense of conscience, perhaps some voices scattered suggesting an alternative. But God released them to their choices of embracing depravity. And watch what happens. They became filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They're gossips, slanderers. It's, it's worth noting, I believe, that gossip and slander are rolled right in there with envy, murder. Another day. God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful, they invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They're senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree, this is affirming what I suggested to you a moment ago. These aren't the unprepared. They're not the uneducated. They aren't the unchurched. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but they also approve of those who practice them. We talk a bit about spiritual gifts, manifestations of the Spirit, the things that the Spirit of God will bring to our lives, demonstrations of His power, His grace, and His mercy to help us accomplish His purposes. We need to understand there's another kind of gift as well. 
If you choose not to retain the knowledge of God, if you choose to hide it, to ignore it, to bury it, God will give you the gift of having what you want. He will release you. Church, it should sober us. How do we find ourselves in a place where we are today, where marriage is redefined, where our children are being mutilated, with the support of the state, and far too frequently the applause of the scientific community? How did we arrive there? Because our salt and light is so small, so dim. We've had a knowledge of God, but it was, it was awkward to have to acknowledge it. And God, I believe, has given us over to some things. And I believe it can be reversed. I believe it can or we wouldn't have been given the message. We're not the first group who has had the challenge. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It's a church Paul helped form. It's a church that was very spiritually active and a church that was very, very carnal. Paul said there's immorality amongst you that even the pagans don't do. That is not a compliment. When the founder of your congregation says you're more immoral than the ungodly people in your community, he's not cheering for them. Chapter 12 and verse 20, he said, I'm afraid that when I come, I may not find you as I want you to be. And you may not find me as you want me to be. I fear that there could be quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, factions, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. I'm afraid that when I come again, my God will humble me before you, and I'll be grieved over many who have sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, the sexual sin, and the debauchery in which they have indulged. I just point that out. I don't want us to imagine it's because it's the end of the age that we're struggling. Carnality and selfishness have flourished in the church as long as, they've, as, long as we've existed. But we don't have to capitulate. Now, Paul warned Timothy, a young man he's mentoring, that as we approach the end of the age, it'll become more intense. So those tendencies will intensify. We'll have to be on our guard even more carefully. 2 Timothy 3, mark this. There'll be terrible times in the last days. The literal translation is the times will be exceedingly fierce. I think it's a better description. And then he lists 18 attributes of the human character that will deteriorate. He didn't point to political deterioration. He doesn't, rise, he doesn't point to the increase in wars. He doesn't comment on climate change. The Bible talks about all those things, but those aren't what Paul is pointing Timothy towards. He said beneath all of that is the deterioration of human character. Listen to this description. Let me ask you the question before you listen. I want you to decide to the degree to which it sounds like contemporary life in the world that we hear about. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. Again, I would point out to you that it's descriptive of a group of people who stand underneath the umbrella of some sort of an organized expression of faith. We would call them church folk. Paul said they'll have a form of godliness. They'll have religious language and religious services. They'll have religious books. They're going to use a lot of good phrases. He said have nothing to do with them. They love pleasure more than they love God. They love themselves more than they love God. They love money more than they love God. Don't have anything to do with them. I don't believe that's the message that we've been encouraged to adopt. But Paul didn't stop there. He said they're the kind who worm their way. He's going to describe these people now. They're the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women who are loaded down with sins and swayed by all kinds of evil desires. Always learning, but never able to acknowledge the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses. They were the, the sorcerers of Egypt. When Moses came with his staff to throw it down before Pharaoh and it became a snake, he called for the magicians of Egypt. And they threw their staffs down as well. Remember the story? They became snakes. But Moses' snake swallowed theirs. He said, as we approach the end of the age and the times become fierce, there will be expressions of the occult that oppose the purposes of God. So also these men oppose the truth. 
men of depraved mind. It's language very similar to Romans 1, who as far as the faith is concerned are rejected. Now there's two groups of people specified in those last three verses before you turn your page. Uh, I want to be certain that I've offended everyone equally. It helps with my emails. Paul references weak-willed women, and some of you lost all your courage. But in the same passage, he also rep rep reprimands men of depraved minds. All are included. I don't believe it's an attack on any particular segment of the population. I think he's acknowledging the failure across the board. That while we have a semblance of faith, and a vocabulary for our behaviors, that we are loaded down with sin, swayed by all kinds of evil desires. We oppose the truth, and we've allowed our thoughts to be filled with depravity. Depravity is kind of a, a fancy word for when you choose a moral path in opposition to God's. When you reject what you know to be right. See, we very seldom just reject it out of hand. We typically make a case for it. We'll typically point at people with education or status or celebrity or influence and say that we're siding with them. I much prefer to align myself with God. It's not always easy, and I haven't always done it well. But I believe we've begun a season where it's more important for God's people than at any time in our life. It seems to me that what Paul is suggesting, the counsel he's offering, is to limit our exposure to people who have chosen these behaviors, even if they demonstrate a form of godliness. I wouldn't spend my discretionary time there. We live in the world. We go to work in the world. We send our children often to school in the world. And even if you send them to Christian schools, I assure you, those Christian schools are filled with ungodly principles and ideas. That's not theoretical to me. I attended some Christian schools a long time ago, and it was true then. I assure you it's true today. So Paul suggests that we limit our exposure. Don't use our discretionary time to multiply our exposure to those things. In Paul's writing and thought, it's an important point to add to this, to deny the power of God. He said these people have a form of religion, but they'll deny the power of God. In Paul's thought, and I'm not going to walk you through it all, in this session, to deny the power of God is to deny the cross. Because Paul said the cross was the expression of the power of God for all of us who believe. So what the, this group of people will not do is acknowledge the necessity of the cross. Not acknowledge the depravity of sin, that it has to be addressed. You see, sin suggests there's right and wrong. That there's a sovereign God who def can define behavior as moral or immoral, appropriate or inappropriate. And if you deny the power of the cross, you're denying that role to God. Who's to say what's right and wrong, the message goes? Who has the audacity to judge someone else? Well, the Creator does. Amen. Now, the good news, He's identified for us the pathway that will allow us to flourish, to find happiness and contentment and peace in our journey through time. If we reject that, we'll find the op opposite. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly to the full. He said, my adversary comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. So when you find people that suggest to you the cross is really not that central, that Jesus isn't that essential, that no one really has the right to define right and wrong, that we are emerging, we are evolving in how we understand human behavior, understand they're diminishing the redemptive work of Jesus and limit your exposure. I brought you some good news. I thought by this point you'd need a little. <laughs> Colossians chapter 2, Paul's writing to another church that he's been instrumental in helping form. And he's, he's speaking of what the Lord has accomplished. He said, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. See, on the cross, a divinely ordered exchange took place. The reason Jesus had to be tortured to death in public view, hungry, thirsty, naked, in want of all things, he hung on a Roman cross. The sinless, innocent, 
perfect Son of God. And God placed upon him the punishment that was due by divine justice, all of our rebellion, all of our godlessness. Jesus exhausted the curse of sin, that in its place, we might have all the blessings that were due his perfect obedience. Prior to the cross, Satan had a legal claim against every one of us. He could look at Almighty God, a just God, and say, I have a right to them. They're from a fallen race. They're from a race of rebels. He had a legitimate argument. He had a claim against every one of us. But through the cross, Paul says, Jesus disarmed those spiritual powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them, and he triumphed over them by the cross. It's a bit technical, but in, in Roman life, a triumph wasn't the winning of the victory. It was the celebration of the victory. If a general had a, a great victory on some foreign battlefield, occasionally they would be granted a triumph, a, a processional through the streets of Rome. And they would bring the slaves that they captured or the, the plunder of the people that they had defeated. And they'd, they would ride in the chariot through the streets of Rome, celebrating their victory. It was a triumphal procession. And it says the cross made possible a triumphal procession. We are the ones. We're being demonstrated to all of humanity to all the principalities and powers in heaven, all the spiritual forces of wickedness arrayed against us, that through the cross they were defeated, that we can be free, we can be forgiven, we can be justified. We are the demonstration of what Jesus accomplished. Paul wrote to that same Corinthian church in the first chapter, and it's, just, it's not because you were wise or from noble families or from royal birth or because of your remarkable education. It's just quite the opposite. God chose the weak and the depraved and those who weren't so wise so that the only possible glory would go to God. We're the crack potched. He's made into useful vessels for his purposes. It's good news. But we should know above all people that appeasing evil is not a plan to victory. Look at Revelation 1. It says Jesus Christ. It's a description of Jesus at the introduction to the book of Revelation. A triumphant Jesus. He's the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now those are wonderful statements about him, but the next sentence begins to make it personal. He loves us, and he's freed us from our sins by his blood. And he's made us to be kings and priests, to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. It's true there's a conflict in the earth. But God has not left us alone. He hasn't abandoned us. He hasn't withdrawn from us. He has empowered us. He has given us the victory. But he has asked us to stand faithfully as ambassadors for his kingdom in the midst of a fallen and depraved world. The question on the table is what will we do? In this world, in time, in our journey under the sun, the Bible is very clear. We are going to face conflict. Look in John 16, 33. Now you can turn a page. Jesus is speaking to his friends. He said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. In this world you, you will have trouble. Church, we, we've got whole schools of theology. I don't mean institution. I mean whole blocks of Christendom whose messaging is focused on no problems and no trouble. You don't need to go looking for any extra. Enough will find you. But don't live on the fancy, fantasy island of Christians have no problems. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3. Though we live in the world... We do not wage war as the world does. Now, we would like to repunctuate that sentence. Though we live in the world, we do not wage war, period. The awkward part is the sentence says we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, 
We have weapons with divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Is it safe to say our lives are filled with arguments and pretentious spoutings that set themselves up against godly principles? It washes over us like Niagara Falls on a daily basis. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That begins inwardly. We have to take our thoughts and yield them to the authority of Christ. There's a tug of war within every one of us, that same voice that we hear in the garden in Genesis that says, did God really say? That same voice is chirping within every one of us. It plays on a loop, particularly at the points where you are uniquely vulnerable to temptation. Did God really say? Paul is addressing all Christians. He's not speaking to some subgroup of leaders or exceptional disciples. And Paul was brilliant, a classically trained Jewish scholar in the laws of Moses. He purposefully chose military words and phrases. It's not accidental. He talks about war and weapons and destruction of fortresses and taking captives. It's worth noting, in fact, it's an important note, that the New Testament presentation does not place Christians on the defensive. Rather, the language very clearly implies that we are to be on the offensive. As Christ followers, we should be advancing against the adversaries of our Lord, not surrendering to the darkness. Now, that takes courage. It takes intentionality. It takes a willingness to sacrifice. So the question is, does the Bible call for those things? Or is it just a motivational ploy of a pastor who's trying to stir you up for whatever the next project is? Look at Matthew 16 and verse 18. Jesus again, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Jesus is describing his church as advancing against the fortifications of evil. In antiquity, cities didn't defend themselves with iron domes and long-range intercontinental ballistic missiles. They defended themselves with stone walls. And they would build a wall around the city and make provision for water and food. So in case of the approach of an enemy, you would close the gates and imagine the walls protected you from the enemy. You were unassailable. And Jesus flips the script. He said the church will not be able to be withstood. They will take the fortresses of evil. It's the same language of 2 Corinthians 10. We'll have divine power to demolish strongholds. Jesus is describing his church, advancing against the fortifications of evil, and the church is triumphant. Evil cannot withstand our advance. That's not the mentality or the emotion in the present day church. We seem far more frightened, far more threatened, far less aware of who we are in Christ. Amen. We're appeasing. We're yielding. We're surrendering. The enemy should be anxious about the activity of the church. What will they do next? One of my objectives in doing this little series with you is to begin to restore the initiative to God's people. Look in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18. Again, a young man Paul is mentoring. Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this instruction, and I'm keeping with the prophecies previously made about you so that you may strongly engage in battle. So that you may strongly engage in battle, having faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected these things, and they've suffered the shipwreck of their faith. You see, we think it's a, a zero-sum game. We can choose to be ambassadors, or we can choose to be undercover agents. And there's no difference. The Bible suggests to us there's very much a difference. We read it in the previous session that when we get to the end of the book of Revelation, the awards, the rewards go to the overcomers. And those left on the outside are the cowardly and the unbelieving. So I would submit to you, it really isn't that both options are legitimate. I believe we're counseled to choose to be intentional ambassadors for the kingdom of God. 
2 Timothy chapter 2, message, same young man. Paul's writing him. He says, endure suffering with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Paul's assumption is that Timothy is a soldier engaged in spiritual warfare. Paul reminds Timothy that hardship and difficulty are to be anticipated, that they come with the journey. I'm not sure we're prepared for that. And, typ and typically, we talk in, in presenting the gospel and inviting people towards the kingdom of God, we focus on blessings and mercy and good things, and they're all true. I'm not, I don't think we should ignore those, but at some point, we have to transition to what it means to be mature in Christ. We can't spend all of our lives as children hoping someone else will protect us, feed us, clean us, care for us, provide for us. At some point, we're asked to take our place in the unfolding purposes of God. Amen is the word you're searching for. I'm just a little ahead. I got to prepare this, so I'm already warmed up. Paul is reminding Timothy that civilian life and serving in the military are two very different kinds of existence. They're not the same. They are not the same. Timothy is being reminded that he is set apart to serve his commanding officer. We've cultivated another gospel that suggests very broadly that heaven and all of their resources are organized to serve us. It's perversion. 2 Timothy 3, same book, next chapter. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my endurance, my persecutions, my sufferings, what kind of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. You can go look those up in the book of Acts. There were riots and beatings and attempts to, to murder Paul. He said, you know all about my way of life. I'm reminding you to live like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be what? It really says that, doesn't it? I looked up the Greek word. I thought maybe it was a translational problem. I thought maybe you'd say everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will get free parking. <laughs> we'll be persecuted. Well, I want to wrap this up. My time's about gone. I just want to give you one suggestion on how we can increase our effectiveness. And it really has to do with how we process our journey through time. I've spent a few years serving the church. It's, 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 the, it's a great delight in my life. But I, I want to encourage you not to boast about the attacks of the enemy which you witness. Don't boast in the attacks of the enemy which you witness. I don't believe it's an expression of tremendous discernment to be able to identify all the ways that spiritual attacks impact your life. I believe the real objective is to be the living example of triumph. Let the fruit of your life be the declaration that in Christ we have the victory. It seems far too often we like to bemoan the attacks. I'm not asking you to be dishonest. I'm asking you to change your focus. Too often we try to establish our value by recounting the spiritual attacks that we can identify. I have found it in my life and the lives of others to be far more beneficial to demonstrate the resurrection power of our Lord. One more scripture, 1 Peter chapter 2. How is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. So Jesus is going to model a behavior for us. 
He said, you're supposed to act like he acted, follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. He's quoting from the prophets. When they hurled their insults at him, he didn't retaliate. He's not quoting the prophets now. Peter watched it. Peter listened to the beating begin with Jesus. He watched him carrying a cross through the streets of Jerusalem. When they hurled their insults at him, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. He could have. He said to Peter, put your sword away. If we needed angels, I got some angels. He didn't retaliate. He made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree. That's the exchange I mentioned. So that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, we've been healed. So here's the shorthand on this. Poor planning on our part is not a spiritual attack. That's not the devil. A lack of effort on our part is not a demonic assault. It's lazy. Come on, church. We've adopted a whole spiritual vocabulary to explain away our indifference, our appeasement. I don't believe that its evil has grown stronger. I think we've grown less and less interested in righteousness. Being unprepared does not indicate the presence of principalities and powers. It indicates a lack of preparation. However, in fairness, the absence of a prayer life, little knowledge of Scripture, the failure to routinely gather with God's people, the lack of obedience to the truth that you already know, or the absence of generosity with your time and your money, or the cultivation, the intentional cultivation of pride or selfish ambition or greed, those things will devastate you. Because you are opening the doors wide to spiritual forces other than the kingdom of heaven. We can improve our effectiveness tremendously by simply changing the way we are imagining our lives. Let's decide to become the triumphal procession of a victorious king. And let our words and our actions and our life choices reflect the majesty of his kingdom. Now that is an appealing presentation. We're gonna close with communion. We're going to come to the cross. If you're on campus, when you entered whichever sanctuary or worship space this morning, there were ushers there with communion. If you missed that, there's some in the aisles. If you'll raise a hand, they'll bring it to you. If you're at home and you weren't prepared, run quickly. Grab a cup of water and a cracker. Grab a chocolate chip cookie and a Dr. Pepper. It's not healthy, but you're only going to take a little bit. Don't drink three liters and call it communion. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but you don't have to have a wafer stamped with a religious symbol. Thank God. Communion is not just a, some sort of a religious exercise. It's a tangible reminder of what Jesus has done for us through his redemptive work on the cross, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That is the basis upon which we can approach the throne of God. In Hebrews, we're invited to come boldly before the throne of grace. Not because of who we are, but because of what Jesus has done for us. That's the reason that on a regular basis we will celebrate communion together. Because as we walk through our days and our weeks, we accumulate stuff. We accumulate our own needs for forgiveness. We accumulate the, the persons from our journey whom we need to forgive. We face challenges physically, relationally economically, all sorts of places where we need God's help. And so we come to the cross, to the communion table, to remember, to be reminded, to acknowledge by faith God's total provision for our lives. Remember what Peter said? He's given us everything we need for life and godliness. Now, which piece of that you need to appropriate today is up to you. Some of you need forgiveness. You've been walking too far in the world. You weren't confused. You just enjoyed it. Or it was easier to go along than stand up. 
Some of us need to forgive others. There have been things said about you that aren't true. They were hurtful. They were painful. You have suffered because of wicked and evil, wickedness and evil in the world. But you have to forgive. Some of us have real physical challenges. I'm grateful for doctors and medical science. I'm not opposed to that in the very least. But God is the healer. Some of us need financial help. We need wisdom. A lot of different things. But through the cross, God has made provision. And for that reason, we come to the communion table. It's the reason Jesus went to the cross. See, it's foolish to trust God for your eternity and not believe he can help you now. That makes no sense. It's also foolish to think you would gladly stand up for him in eternity if you won't stand up for him now. Jesus himself implemented this. He had the Passover meal with the disciples. And at the end of the meal, he took bread and he broke it. And he said to them, this is my body broken for you. He hasn't been to the cross yet. This will become far more powerful for them in 72 more hours. This is my body broken for you. As often as you eat this, do this in remembrance of me. Let's receive together. And then he took a cup and said, this cup is a new covenant, literally a new contract, sealed with my own blood. As often as you drink it, you proclaim my death until you see me again. Let's receive together. Will you stand with me for this prayer? Even at home. Huh? Father, thank you. Thank you for your great love for us, for the mercy that was expressed towards us in Jesus. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your faithfulness, that in your love for us, you offered yourself as a sacrifice, that we might be delivered from the kingdom of darkness. We praise you for it today. We give you glory and honor and thank you for that. We praise you for it. Lord, we come in humility to acknowledge our own sins, those places where we have made choices that were dishonoring, that were disobedient. Forgive us. We weren't confused or distracted. It wasn't a lack of understanding. We were willfully rebellious, and we repent. Lord, for those we need to forgive, those who have stood in opposition, who through words or actions have brought pain or hardship or difficulty. Lord, we release them today. We cancel every debt. We turn them loose. That just as you have forgiven us, Father, we forgive them. We pray for those in our midst who have great needs today, physically, emotionally, in relationships. Lord, whatever the challenges may be, I thank you that your power is present to heal and restore and deliver and renew. I praise you for it. Lord, however you choose to bring the deliverance, we thank you now that we will live in those experiences of your faithfulness and your provision. I thank you that greater is he who is for us than all those things that are arrayed against us. We praise you that you're awakening your church to be a triumphal procession of our victorious king that your glory may be made evident throughout all the earth, that the name of Jesus might be extended, that the name of Jesus may be exalted, and the kingdom of God expanded. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Why don't you give the Lord a hand, huh? God bless you.